Today, friends, we're eavesdropping on a very intimate story. A story filled with religious ceremony and prophecy of longing and blessing. During COVID, in the midst of the hardest part, I officiated at a wedding of a sweet couple. It was a rather intimate affair outside just the immediate family as there was COVID. Now, the couple wasn't super religious, and they already had their wedding documented at the courthouse, so my presence wasn't really needed, and neither was the church's. But they were doing something at the church maybe because they thought they should, or that having God be a part of the wedding seemed right to them. But what happened was very special. Every person in their family was able to read a blessing to them in a circle around them, just right around them. And later they told me that they really felt it. They felt the blessing. Here are a few samples. Often blessings start with phrases like, may you. Okay. May you always allow your love for each other to be a source of strength which feeds your soul. May you each day fill one another's cup before you drink from your own. May you sing and dance together, but remember that though you may move together, you each must dance to your own steps. May your hearts stay full, your spirits stay connected, and may you live long and happily in one another's arms. May you feel no rain, for each of you will be shelter for the other. May you feel no cold, for each of you will be warmth for the other. And may beauty surround you both in the journey ahead and through all the years. May happiness be your companion and your days together be good and long upon the earth. We could all live into these beautiful blessings, couldn't we? Blessings, friends, are very important in our lives. They date back centuries to the Jewish tradition of blessing. It's hard to remember sometimes that our Jesus was born into a devout Jewish family. And right here in this today's scripture, we hear three devout practices. One, circumcision. Two, purification from childbirth. And three, consecration of the firstborn. Now, the Jewish ceremony of circumcision on the eighth day after birth places the sign of the covenant on each male child who then becomes a part of the Jewish nation. How many of you have ever been to a bris ceremony? I have. Now, the circumcision is done right in front of you in someone's home, usually by a rabbi. And it, it's a time of joy and celebration, lots of fun food, and a little bit of pain for the baby. A little bit. Uh, but they soak a rag in some wine, and the baby sucks on a blanket or a rag to get the wine to help ease them. And then mom will usually, immediately after it's done, nurse the baby. So it's also the ceremony where the child is named. In the passage we read today, naming is mentioned. And Luke notes, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. His name Jesus, Hebrew Yeshua, means salvation. Now, the purification ritual was very important as well. Listen to what the law reads in Leviticus for Mary about being pure. A woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be ceremonially unclean for seven days, just as she is unclean during her monthly cycle. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. Then the woman must wait 33 days to be purified from her bleeding. She must not touch anything sacred or go to the sanctuary until the days of her purification are over. When the days of purification for a son or daughter are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting a year-old lamb for burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for sin offering. If she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons, one for burnt offering, the other for sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her and she will be clean. Wow. So Mary came to the temple after the waiting period. And did you notice in the picture, what did they hold up? It wasn't a lamb, it was pigeons. They couldn't afford a lamb. And I find it very interesting in some way that the bleeding associated with birth is in need of atonement. I'm not sure I fully understand this particular right, but I'm gonna assume it probably has to do with transfer of body fluids and a society that had no protection from disease of any kind. Leviticus was taking care of the people. The third ritual, the consecration of the firstborn also needs a little bit of explanation. You see, the early Hebrews believe that the firstborn male of humans and animals belonged to God. It's in Exodus 13. They were consecrated or holy to God. In Greek, hagios means reserved for God and God's service. Now, how many remember the story of Moses and the Pharaoh? Moses and the Pharaoh, right? 
That's why God sends the spirit of death to the Egyptians to kill their firstborn son during that time of Moses and the deliverance. The firstborn sons were the ones who were consecrated in the Jewish faith. Therefore, they were inflicting the most painful thing they could on the Pharaoh's people through their own faith traditions, assuming that the killing of the firstborn of those Egyptians would so frighten them and be for, make them forlorn so badly, they'd release them from slavery. And it happened. We've reviewed the rituals, and we know why Mary and Joseph were at the temple and the importance of them being there. But why are Simeon and Anna there? And what about them is so important? Okay, for any of you who are there on Christmas Day, Christmas Day, think back. We're studying John. Can you think of a really important reason why Simeon and Anna were there in that place and it relates to John the Baptist. Think about that. And call it out if you know. It relates to John the Baptist. Simeon and Anna are the same reason why John the Baptist was sent. Can you think about that? Why do you think? What was John the Baptist for Jesus? He came before. We discussed he was a very important witness. He was a witness. Simeon and Anna are another witness to Jesus. Different kind of witness, definitely. It's kind of like if you're in an accident and the police ask you, did anyone witness the accident? It's very similar. Did anyone witness the circumcision and the naming of the child? Very important. In fact, Simeon's name means hearing in Hebrew. The text says that Simeon is righteous and has the Holy Spirit resting on him. That seems like a strange thing to say, the Holy Spirit resting on him. Yet the phrase, the Holy Spirit was upon him, mimics the Old Testament prophets, where the Holy Spirit sometimes came upon the prophets to accomplish a specific task for God or to speak to the people. Yet the New Testament has a different idea, with the Holy Spirit dwelling permanently within Christians rather than just occasionally coming up for prophets and the particular tasks that were needed. The text says that Simeon has been anticipating this day in the temple for a long time. He's been waiting for an almost impossible thing to happen, for the consolation of Israel and for the Messiah to come. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. In our passage, Simeon is eagerly looking forward to the time when the Roman-occupied, weary Jerusalem receives her comfort and relief from God, which was expected to happen when the Messiah would come. Now, Anna was an old woman who practically lived at the temple. Her husband had died only seven years after she was married, so she was a widow for a long time. But God called her as a prophet, and she was very devout. She was at the temple when Jesus was brought in by his parents. She was placed there at exactly the right time to be a witness and to be able to share the good news like the shepherds. But her position is not seen as lowly. Instead, she holds some authority as she's seen a little bit as a temple prophet. Interesting that in this text, she does not, did you notice that, never speaks words directly to the parents or the baby, ever. But she does talk about the child. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Simeon was old. Anna was old. They both waited a very long time to see the Messiah, and each one of these older people played a very important role in the beginning of the life of Jesus, and they were blessed for their waiting. They had to wait to be blessed a long, long time, and then there was the Messiah. How many times in our own lives have we waited for a blessing? How many times in our own lives have we been given a blessing and we walk right by it? How many times in our lives have we yearned for a blessing that would never, ever come? You heard the blessings given to the couple at their wedding by their families, and now I'm wondering out loud, if we work together, why a blessing might look like to us from God. Let's think about it for a minute. Let's call out what a perfect blessing might look like for you, for a family member, for a loved one, what that might look like. A perfect blessing. A couple wanting to conceive, that's right, a blessing. A couple wanting to conceive, uh huh, right. Anything else that you can think of? Another, a blessing. Is there a blessing you can think of? 
How would you want to be blessed by God? How would you want to be blessed by God? What? Those two things, Jen. A child find. May your child find true love. I love that. Yes. May you have good health and healing. That's what you're thinking too, that good health and healing. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, Pat. Yes. Children find, may your children find peace and contentment. It's really important, isn't it? A lot of us have troubled children that are having tough times right now. May your children find peace and contentment. Let me read a few more to you. I've got quite a few here that kind of came up. May you know that you are worthy of my love. Can you, sp God speaking that. May you know that you're worthy of my love. May your child restore their health and well-being. May you always look toward me, your God, and know that I would never leave you or forsake you. Oh. May the mourning that you're still feeling become a part of you and not overtake you. May you find peace in your marriage. May you find peace in your relationships with your children. May you find peace in your relationships with yourself. May you find peace and acceptance in the fact that your parents will never now, nor will they ever be able to then, fully be able to give you the blessings that you need sometimes. But I can. May you learn how to give me your burdens and not take them on alone. Oh, God can be so powerful, can he? May you come to know me fully before you die. Friends, there are many ways that God blesses us, but often to receive the blessing, there's a time of waiting. There's a time of growing, a time of learning in order to fully understand the blessing from God in order to fully receive the blessing from God. And we've never met God face to face. And you see, friends, if Simeon and Anna had never seen the Messiah, their lives would still have been important to God. They still would have received blessing. They serve faithfully. And they are blessed in their service. And we, too, are blessed every time we serve, every time we fellowship with one another, every time we bring the light into the neighborhood, every time we come into this place, either in person or online, every time we sit in these chairs, either in person or in your living room, every time we walk up to this table or you have a table in your home, we are blessed by God. And you know why? Because we genuinely seek Jesus and one of the places that we find Jesus is at the table and in joyful celebration of his life and his resurrection. So we're going to sing together for a moment. I'm going to wait here. Sally, can I hand this to you? Thank you so much. Friends, at the table is a place where we find God's blessings often. So we're singing a song. Some of you know this song. It's, I believe it's in our hymnal. And we'll be able to share it together.